we have gotten a couple indications that AI insiders aren't just focused on artificial general intelligence, but possibly artificial super intelligence. So first up, Sam Altman published an essay titled The Gentle Singularity, where he argues the singularity, which is this hypothesized point where AI surpasses human intelligence, he argues it has quietly begun. In the essay, he argues that humanity has crossed what he calls the event horizon towards digital superintelligence. But what's interesting is this is all happening a bit quieter than anyone expected. We don't yet have robots on the streets or superhuman AI running things, but AI systems are outperforming humans in lots of cognitive tasks. And the phase we're entering, he says, will feel more like acceleration than disruption. He outlines a near future where scientific breakthroughs arrive faster than we can imagine. And by 2027, he predicts robots will be handling real-world tasks. By 2030, productivity could be an order of magnitude higher than it was in 2020. Now, he calls this kind of a gentle singularity because each of these wonders, he argues, is just going to quickly become kind of normal life. We get used to all the progress. It just becomes mundane and we go on living our lives. Now, at the same time, we got news that Meta is making a bold new bet on superintelligence. Mark Zuckerberg has launched a secretive new AI division aimed squarely at building superintelligence. To kickstart it, he's personally recruiting dozens of top AI researchers, and he has placed Alexander Wang, the founder of Scale AI, at the head of this. He's able to do that because Meta is looking to acquire a 49% stake in Scale AI, which is best known for labeling the data that trains lots of the top AI systems. Now, this deal values Scale AI at $28 billion. Meta is hoping that Wang and his team and infrastructure can help fix what Zuckerberg sees as a performance lag in Meta's a Llama AI models. And their mandate is to beat the competition to AGI and possibly super intelligence, then embed those across Meta's ecosystem. So, Paul, let's first start here with Altman's essay. There are some big claims in here. Altman didn't invent the concept of the singularity, but he thinks we're approaching some version of it. What, what do you think? Uh, there's so many ways to go with this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, episode 129, we actually, we had a main topic that was just literally just titled superintelligence. And so I was going back and trying to figure out what led us to talk about it at that point. Um, and it was a Sam Altman tweet. So on January 4th of 2025, Sam tweeted, I always wanted to write a six word story. Here it is near the singularity, unclear which side, <laughs> meaning are we before or after the singularity has it already occurred? Um, and so I then kind of shared the story of like this idea of, uh, super intelligence. And so again, you can go back and listen to episode 129. Um, but what I shared at that point was there was a, a, a paper published by, um, the Google DeepMind team, Shane Legg, who kind of coined the, the, the term AGI, um, the levels of AGI for operationalizing progress on the path to AGI. So in that paper. Uh, DeepMind tried to lay out these sort of different levels of artificial intelligence, level zero being no AI, level five being superhuman. And so in their paper, level five is super intelligence. And so the highest level in their matrix is termed combined performance and generality. The, the definition means that level five general AI or artificial superintelligence will be able to do a wide range of tasks at a level that no human can match. So they define superhuman performance as outperforming 100% of humans. So when we're talking about superintelligence, people have different definitions, but that is like the Google DeepMind definition. Um, in terms of this, Sam's most recent essay, he likes these essays. He's um, been writing more of them, it seems, lately. Uh, in February of this year, we had three observations from Sam. We'll put the links to each of these in there. I'm not going to dive into each of these right now. In January of this year, we had reflections uh, from Sam. In May of last year, or um, yeah, May of this year, actually, we had GPT-40, where he kind of talked about the new model and the implications. 
But the one I want to linger on for a minute is Moore's Law for Everything. And this is from March 16th, 2021. Anyone who's heard me give a, a, a keynote, I will often reference this article because it was a moment in time when everyone wasn't listening to Sam yet. There, you know, certainly within Silicon Valley and the tech world. But generally speaking, when Sam wrote things, it didn't like change the world and people's perspective on things. And, and, um, so I'm just going to read a couple of quick uh, paragraphs from this one because it sets the stage for the gentle singularity one. So again, March 2021, Moore's Law for Everything, Altman wrote, <clears throat> my work at OpenAI reminds me every day about the magnitude of the socioeconomic change that is coming sooner than most people believe. Software that can think and learn will do more and more of the work that people do now. Even more power will shift from labor to capital. If public policy doesn't adapt accordingly, most people will end up worse off than they are today. So again, remember, this is a year and a half before ChatGPT. Think of what he was saying, what he was predicting, and the time period we find ourselves in. So he continued in the next five years, which would put us up to 2026, computer program, uh, pr programs that can think will read legal documents and give medical advice in the next decade. They will do assembly line work and maybe even become companions. And then the decades after that, they will do almost everything, including making new scientific discoveries <clears throat> that will expand our concept of everything. The coming change will center around the most impressive of our capabilities, the phenomenal ability to think, create, understand, and reason to the three great technological revolutions, the ag agricultural, the industrial, and the computational. We will add a fourth, the AI revolution. This revolution will generate enough wealth for everyone to have what they need if we as a society make it reason, uh, re make it responsibly. So I, I share that before I comment on the, this gentle singularity one, because um, certainly Sam can be perceived as a hype man who's trying to raise the value of his companies and you know, raise more money and, and do all these things. Um, but as someone who's like followed his work and his writings for like a decade now, he generally writes things that he has seen or that he is very confident are going to be true in the near future based on things that he has seen or the trajectory of the things that they're built. So my personal experience is he, he, he's not really someone who tries to overhype things. He's someone who actually sort of sees more of the future than most of us get access to. And he tries through his words to prepare people for that future. <laughs> Um, so then when we get into this, this, the gentle singularity, um, uh, a book, bo both you and I read Mike super intelligence path, dangers and strategies from Nick Bostrom. I think it came out in 2014. Uh, they all read that book too. Mm -hmm. I am actually listening to empire of AI right now from Karen Howe that we mentioned on the show a couple of weeks ago. And she tells the story of the creation of open AI and the significance of that book and Bostrom's thinking to Demis Asabis and Elon Musk and Sam Altman in those that time period, in that 2014 uh, realm. Mm. So this idea of super intelligence and then even going further back to singularity, like this is not new stuff for these people. They have thought about this. They have worked towards these concepts. So the singularity is sort of this, in theory, hypothet hypothetical point where AI surpasses human intelligence, uh, leading to the rapid and uncontrollable technological advancements. So it suggests that AI becomes self-improving and it can create these super intelligent mach machines that are beyond human comprehension. So when we talk about singularity, we are, we are now not just talking about AGI where it's like generally capable of doing what the average human does. We are talking about an AI that is beyond any human that has ever lived, like at everything. Mm. And so that's what you have to understand him to mean when he's talking about the singularity. He's talking about the moment when super intelli intelligence has arrived. And his tweet from January is like, maybe it's here, maybe it's not, but we're close to it either way. So a couple of excerpts. He says, we have recently built systems that are smarter than people in many ways and are able to significantly amplify the output of people using them. The least likely part of the work is behind us. Uh, the scientific insights that got us to systems like GPT-4 and O3 were hard won, but will take us very far. So what he's saying is the really unknown parts already happened. Like we proved that intelligence could 
exist, that it could reason, that it could think, that it create, that it understand. Mm. Now it's just solve a few roadblocks and like we get there is kind of what he's saying. So he said, in some big sense, ChatGPT is already more powerful than any human who has ever lived. 2025 has seen the arrival of agents that can do real cognitive work. Writing computer code will never be the same. 2026 will likely see the arrival of systems that can figure out novel insights. 2027 may see the arrival of robots that can do tasks in the real world. This generally aligns with the AGI timeline episode that I did. Um, and you can, we'll put the show notes and that was at 142. I forget what episode that was. That sounds um, right. But yeah, we'll yeah. drop it in the notes. So yeah, when I laid out the AGI timeline, nothing he's saying here changes my perspective so far. He then continued, a lot more people will be able to create software and art, but the world wants a lot more of both and experts will probably still be much, <laughs> probably carries a lot of weight here. Experts will probably still be much better than novices as long as they embrace the new tools. Generally speaking, the ability for one person to get much more done in 2030 than they could in 2020 will be a striking change and one many people will figure out how to benefit from. So this is kind of like the source of his optimism. He talks about, uh, we do not know how far beyond human level intelligence we can go, but we are about to find out. Um, talks about already we live in incredible digital intelligence and some initial shock. Most of us are pretty used to it. So he's basically saying like things happen. These things got crazy smart and we just sort of adapted to it. And he thinks singularity is going to be something similar. It's just going to happen and we're going to adapt. I did think this was interesting and I saw a lot of people sort of citing this one. Uh, he said, as data center production gets automated, the cost of intelligence should eventually converge to near the cost of electricity. And then in parentheses, he put this, people are often curious about how much energy a chat GPT query uses. The average query uses about 0.34 watt hours, about what an oven would use in a little over one second, or a high efficiency light bulb would use in a couple of minutes. It also uses about Point, I can't even see how many zeros that is, zero, 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 eight, five gallons of water, roughly one fifteenth of a teaspoon. Mm. I've never seen those num like numbers like that before, Mike, no. broken out. I don't know if you have either. <laughs> okay. Um, he said there'll be, <laughs> there will be hard parts, like whole classes of jobs going away. But on the other hand, we will be getting much uh, richer so quickly that we'll be able to seriously entertain new policy ideas. Looking forward, this sounds hard to wrap our heads around, but probably living through it will feel impressive, but manageable. Uh, and then he kind of wraps with, and again, I'm just pulling out excerpts. There's a, this, this is like probably like a 2,500 word article. Uh, we, in parentheses, the whole industry, not just open AI, are building a brain for the world. It will be extremely personalized and easy for everyone to use. We will be limited by good ideas. For a long time, technical people in the startup industry have made fun of the idea guys, quotes, <laughs> People who had an idea and were looking for a team to build it, it now looks to me like they are about to have their day in the sun. Meaning being able to build things isn't going to be the hard part anymore. Right. It's going to be the people with the ideas to build things. So I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that before we talk about scale, but it's <laughs> it's a lot. And I want to, again, for people who haven't been following AI for years or maybe listening to this podcast for the last couple of years, and this is all still kind of new to you and you're trying to figure out who is Sam and what is open AI and why is it so important? And why is everybody talking about them all the time? Sometimes I like to just like provide a little bit of a historical context as to kind of who they are, where they are. And I, I would actually, I'm not through the whole empire of AI book yet, Yeah, but um, it, it does do a really good job in the first couple of chapters of teeing up how Sam got where he is and, and became so powerful. Um, and it's very complimentary to the Genius Makers book by Kate Metz that we always recommend, Mike. Yeah, the only thing I'll say here is I love Sam's essays typically. And I agree with you. I don't really read into these like, oh, he's hyping anything up. But I do have to say that when you write that there are very hard parts like whole classes of jobs going away, we probably won't adopt a new social contract all at once. But when we look back in a few decades, the gradual changes will have amounted to something big. And then in the same breath, you say, it'll probably feel impressive, but manageable to live through is insane to me. Like we're speaking out both sides of our mouth here and I no, get no. what he's getting at. And I don't think it's necessarily malicious, but we glossed real hard over these parts. 
Yeah, and I think, Mike, it's like we see this with all of them. I mean, Dario Amade is the only one who's sort of broken exactly, right. the thread lately. <laughs> but, I mean, Demis Asabas, who is, you know, by far the guy I admire the most in the space, he constantly is like, yeah, man, this is going to happen really fast and we're not ready and, like, it's going to be amazing. We're going to solve all diseases and travel the universe. But, like, it may just destroy jobs. Like, I don't <laughs> and it's for philosophers and, you know, sociologists and e economists to figure out. So, yeah, I, I think that a lot of these leaders have to have this, like, undying optimism yeah. that what they're doing will change the world in a super positive way and that there's going to be hard parts. But at the end of the day, they believe so deeply that what they're doing will have a net positive impact on society that they have to do it. And like, they hope someone else figures out <laughs> how to pick up the pieces along the way. And I'm by no know. means a doomer about this. I'm very excited. Too. Yeah. I just think like we've had way smaller disruptions to jobs that have had huge impacts on society than what I think is coming. So.